and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Cambridge Union for our first event of Easter term 2017. My name is Harry, I'm president of the society, and I hope that you're very, very excited about the speaker that we have joining us this evening. Not just excited about him, but excited about the really quite stellar lineup we have for the entire term. I hope to see the chamber this full uh, every single day for the next two weeks that we have a speaker event, which is 10 of the next 14 days. We're really packing it in before people's exams, and we hope that you're going to enjoy your time in Cambridge, in Easter, and in Michaelmas, uh, and in Easter term as much as you possibly can. So before we introduce our speaker this evening, just a couple of brief housekeeping notices. Uh, the first and most important of which is that if you refrain from taking any photos during the course of Stephen's talk, that would be fantastic. Uh, we have our own very skilled professional photographers who will be covering and will be putting all the pictures on Facebook really quite quickly after the event, so you won't miss any of the action from that uh, by taking your own photos. And secondly, uh, if you could remain seated at the end of the talk to allow uh, Stephen and uh, the rest of the committee to leave, that would be fantastic. Uh, you'll be directed by the individuals in the rather fetching neon jackets as to when it is appropriate for you to leave. To those of you who are sat in the library, thank you so much for coming, and we're sorry that the chamber wasn't big enough to hold you all. If you want to get involved in the event by asking Stephen questions, if you could tweet uh, to the Cambridge Union, that's at Cambridge Union, with the hashtag CUSOutflow, that would be fantastic, and we'll sh make sure that some of your questions are read out. But now on to the two individuals that I'm about to introduce. Jonah Serks is our speakers officer for Easter term and is the reason that an awful lot of the stellar speakers that you'll be seeing here in the union this term are coming to speak here. We're incredibly delighted that he'll be interviewing the next man, a man who needs absolutely no introduction, author, broadcaster, and bona fide national treasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stephen Fry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Oh. I'm nice. Thank you. Oh. How lovely. Ah. <laughs> so good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, we're very lucky to have Stephen here this evening. Uh, he will be. No, we are. Uh, he will be giving a short speech about things he's interested in. And uh, after that, we'll have a few questions, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, one thing, and this is especially if you're in an overflow room or watching from home, if you're not here, you can still ask questions by tweeting um, at the Cambridge Union or by using hashtag CUSFry or hashtag CUSFryOverflow if you want us to let, you, let us know you're actually in the building. But, you know, um, and I will ask your question. Uh, but without further ado... Stephen. Oh, thank you very much, Jonah. Should I stand up? Well, yes, I probably should, shouldn't I? There are, hello! <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're going to be talking a little about mental health, so if I say don't jump off. Um, <laughs> it's partly because mental health is too important a subject to take entirely seriously. Like all human subjects, uh, it should be something we can laugh about, because unless we laugh about it, we won't understand it. Now, um, it seems to me rather pointless for me to talk to you about mental health in abstract terms because um, nobody really understands mental health in abstract terms. They only understand it in terms of its, um, well, it's Cambridge, in terms of its instantiation, its reification. Oh, it's Cambridge in the 21st century. You won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, it's embodiment. It's uh, examples of it. So in that sense, me, I can only talk about my own experience with my... Uh, with my mental health or lack of. Um, it, it's, um, it's very hard to say where anything begins, isn't it? But you have to decide when telling a story where, where to snip the piece of string at, at each end to, to make a beginning and an end. So I'll start with myself as young. I, I grew up in the countryside in East Anglia. Not, not very close to Cambridge, but in East Anglia. And far, far from the nearest, as Sidney Smith put it, far from the nearest lemon. It was the nearest shop was four, four or five miles away. Um, Norwich was a dream. It was a, it was a three-hour bicycle ride. Um, and so I just grew up in a, in a large, not Downton Abbey, but a large-ish house. There were no more than three or four servants. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I, so it, it, it looks like, uh, when I see pictures of the house, it looks very idyllic. There were gardeners, there were people to come and do things and cook and whatever. But uh, it's... You know, everyone's childhood is 
about how they respond to themselves, their parents, their siblings, their friends. And I was, um, I was always aware from, from the very first that I was different, not just in, I suppose, the obvious way, you know, growing up in the 60s, which is a way to do with one's sexuality. Um, I always say that I, you know, when, say, when did you know you were gay? And, and I think being born, you know, I look back up and say, that's the last time I'm going up one of those. <laughs> and uh, there's, <laughs> really? No. But aside from that, although maybe part of it, my parents didn't believe in television, really. Um, so you can imagine what a shattering disappointment my life's career choices have been to them. <laughs> but um, they had one. It was about this big, and it lived in a, in a cupboard, uh, and a closed cupboard, and it was only opened and taken out for important things, like I can remember the, the funeral of Winston Churchill. We took the television out and watched. Someone American got assassinated, so we would look at that. And, um, and then the moon landing, I remember we watched that on the television. Otherwise, I wasn't really allowed to watch it, unless my father, who, who worked at home, he was an inventor, he worked in the stable block of the house, which was his laboratory. And if, if I knew he was locked there, I would occasionally watch the television. And one rainy Sunday afternoon, um, I took it out, and a, a film had just started. And I watched this film in great puzzlement. It was... It was like nothing I'd ever seen. People were talking to each other in the most remarkable way. And, you know, we, we take language for granted as children and mostly these days as adults as well. We're aware that there are things humans do which are very special and particular, athletic things, musical things, things to do with painting and rendering objects in uh, sculpture or paint. And we say, what a talent. But we forget that what we're doing now, what uh, we are doing, not just me, I'm speaking, but you're listening, and in listening, you are language processing to a remarkable degree. And we take that for granted. We think of the way we speak as being a fairly ordinary system of exchange of information and ideas, rather than the beautiful thing that it truly is, and the mysterious and, uh, and, and incredible thing that allowed us to leap up uh, or, or across, rather, I suppose one should say, the, the, the evolutionary web and become the creatures that we are. We use it to order pizza on the phone or to tell people we no longer love them or to ask the way to the nearest lavatory or whatever it might be. But this thing I saw was the first example where I was aware that you could use language to seduce and delight and beguile and amuse and tickle in a way that I had not been aware of. And, and I remember this young man saying to this young woman... Um, would you be in any way offended if I said that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection? And I, I, I could almost hear my drool hitting the carpet. <laughs> it was so extraordinary. And, and I watched and watched, and there was more speech like this. It was incredible. I'd never heard anything like it. I didn't know language could do that. I was, I don't know, 10 years old or something. And uh, so it was over. I skipped over to find mother, and I said, Mummy, Mummy, Mummy. And she said, yes, what is it? I said, would you be in any way offended if I said that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection? And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, that's the thing. It was on television. Someone said that. She said, well, what was it? I said, well, there were these people, and it wasn't Shakespearean. It wasn't, it was, it was old times, but not very old, and I can't quite work out when it was. And, oh, they wore these amazing clothes, and, and she fairly worked it out. She said, oh, that was the importance of being earnest, she said. I said, well, well what is it? She said, well, it's a... It's a it's a play. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we've got a copy, but they've they had a fire in the, uh, and a lot of the books have been lost. And so, being in the country, there was this portable library. Every other Thursday, would lumber along his old van, um, and I, I remember waiting. You had to walk about half a mile, waiting for this van lumbered into view, and the driver got out, lit, put up these steps to open the door, patted my bottom into the. Into it. You could do that in those days. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a little lady inside with cardigans and beads. And she uh, said, how can I help you, my dear? And I said, have you heard of a play called The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde? She said, yes, my darling. I said, but have you got it? She looked, and there, indeed, were the comedies of Oscar Wilde in the paperback. So I took it, she stamped it out, and I went, ran the way home, went upstairs, on my bed, I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it. And then, next other Thursday, I went and said, have you got anything else by Oscar Wilde? 
And she said, oh, I aren't sure. I said, let's have a look. And there was a book, and it was called The Trials of Oscar Wilde. And, and she said, oh, I don't know what that is. You can have that. So she stamped that out, and I took it home. <laughs> and it was by someone called Montgomery Hyde, and it was, as the title it makes obvious, really, for us, that it was about Oscar Wilde's, the scandal of Oscar Wilde's love affair with Lord Alfred Douglas and his lawsuit with the Marquis of Queensbury and his subsequent imprisonment for two years at hard labour. And, um, and I read this with a growing bewilderment and astonishment and horror, partly because the man Wilde was being represented as such a, a marvellous man, so warm and kind, so large in spirit, generous intellectually, who made... You know, the, somebody, I think it was Disraeli, said that um, brilliant people can either make you feel four foot tall, because they're so brilliant, you feel small, or they, make, they can make you feel eight foot tall, because they bring you up to their level. And Oscar was someone like that. He made everybody feel, you know, as Shakespeare says, a false stuff, not just a wit, but a cause of wit in others. It's such a great thing to be. And he was a monumental and extraordinary man, and he was brought down lower than any human being, really, in public life had ever been brought down in the age of newspapers and recognition. He was perhaps the first scandal of that kind. It was awful, and I read it through tear-blurred eyes, really, partly because I also recognised that the sin that had brought him down was a, a sin that was stirring inchoately inside me. But also, it did give me this incredible sense of the power of language, and um, I began to read at a furious rate. And all these things are very positive. Uh, and, and we now sort of go to my school days, where I am this rather freakish figure, because I'm uninterested in all the things that schoolboys are supposed to be interested in, like sport, which now is different. I mean, the fact that I'm here tonight, on a night when Ronnie Sullivan is at the table at the <laughs> Crucible, you've no idea what a sacrifice that is for me. But <laughs> as a child, sport in all its forms was absolute anathema. I couldn't abide it. It frightened me, and I thought it was horrible. And similarly, rock music, which everybody listened to, I found that a barbarous assault and made me feel inadequate and small. The only things I found any solace in were these very, you know, things like Greek mythology and, and the works of Oscar Wilde, and also um, of uh, Conan Doyle. I loved, I'd loved Sherlock Holmes from, since I was seven. I used to read the books in that very nerdy way. And I joined the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. Um, and um, I got permission from my housemaster at school. And I don't know how many of you went to a private school. Fortunately, you no longer do I have to explain what a housemaster is, because amongst the many services she has done to the world, J.K. Rowling has made it very clear to a whole generation how private schools work. And, and so <laughs> my, my, um, my Snape signed me out and allowed me <laughs> to leave. And so, um, so I went to London to, for a meeting in the Sherlock Holmes Society. Um, and I had permission to stay for two days. And uh, to cut a very, very long and complicated story short, I stayed for five days and uh, got bitten by the cinema bug. And, and I was expelled from that school. And <laughs> I, had then, I was then expelled from another school and then another one. Um, and, then, and then I went to prison. Um, so we have to picture me now lying athwart flagstones. I like to say athwart. Lying athwart <laughs> flagstones, straw on my back, my heaving, sobbing frame, racked with convulsive, gulping weeping moans, a rat crawling over my <laughs> neck, and the bars of the prison cell thrust athwart my back. Um, so that, that's the picture there. I'm at the lowest ebb uh, you can imagine. And this is very odd, because I come from a stable family of very kind parents indeed, wonderful brother and wonderful sister, both of whom were as normal as, as rice pudding, um, completely... Um, completely, you know, law-abiding and kind and decent people. And I had always had this furious, weird inability to connect with anybody. I suppose, had I been earlier diagnosed, probably ADHD would have been, uh, would have been the, the diagnosis, uh, uh, attention deficit 
hyperactivity disorder, in as much as these diagnoses are any good, because I couldn't concentrate and I was flying all over the place. But there I was in prison, and, and I knew it wasn't normal to be 17 years old and in prison, having had a good education and being curious about the world and excited about the world, having an extraordinary greed about the world. I was always very puzzled by my co-evils, my peers, who were incurious about things, about the world, about history, about reading, um, and, and I couldn't understand it. Um, and I still can't understand it. I still can't understand why people aren't more curious. I suppose, as you can see, I'm quite tubby. And the reason I'm tubby is because I eat, because I'm, I'm greedy. And, and in the same way, I'm greedy for input um, of things. And, and, and it's this manic burning energy that I've always had inside me that I think is a very good thing. But I was always aware there was a, uh, a, a, a countervailing force, uh, something black and dark in me that would take over from this excitable and exciting, grandiose, hyper feeling. Um, and that would, the mixture of the two and the unpredictability of the two and when I would be feeling which, I think contributed to this position of me lying on the floor. And so if you are in the lowest possible state in prison with no future, then obviously the only institution that will accept you is Cambridge University. So that's <laughs> what I set my sights on. Well, no, fortunately, I did at that point decide that I was either going to go entirely to the bad, and it was very possible that it was too late to rescue. I hadn't, you know, done any A-levels or anything. But I, so I, I, I turned myself around and I applied to this veritable inst and venerable institution. And, and, and fortunately, they didn't ask. My, the admissions tutor of Queen's, my colleagues, never had the question of, do, by the way, do you have a serious criminal record? Uh, <laughs> are you by any chance on probation? <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the, the question was never, I don't know if it was ever asked you, it was never asked me. So it was only in my second year when I came off probation that I told the senior tutor of the college, I said, I've got some rather good news. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I just got that. He said, good heavens. And he said, well, I don't know what to say about that. I, I suppose I'd better buy you a drink. And he did. He bought, me, <laughs> he bought me a bottle of gin to celebrate my coming off probation. Um, but Inside, I was always aware of this peculiarity, and I knew it was a peculiarity because if you read and you talk to your friends, you know that not everybody is quite like that. And I was aware that from the very first that I was different. Um, different sexuality is one thing, um, but there were plenty of other gay people at Cambridge, you'd be astonished to know. And um, <laughs> so that was never really an issue, even, even back in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, it wasn't really an issue. But this dark inner thing was something clearly I was going to have to keep private all my life. And it never occurred to me that it was either a good thing or a bad thing or a curse or a blessing. And I don't know if it is any of those things. And I don't know if any of you who have, because you probably recognize that what I've described in very vague terms are the symptoms of what is often called bipolar disorder, a mood disorder, whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. And what I discovered over the, over the 20, 30 years after leaving this place, was that there is something very important to say about these mental health conditions, and they, are, they pull in opposite directions, just as the symptoms of bipolar disorder pull in opposite directions. And the one thing that is very, very crucial to understand is just how serious mental health uh, disorders can be. Um, what medical students amongst you will recognize the word morbidity. The morbidity level, that is to say the tendency towards disease and death, is very much greater for those with a mental health disorder, especially those, of course, who are not from prosperous, stable, accepting, loving families and relationships because unpredictable behavior and particularly the problems... Well, let, let's put it this way. If you have a mood disorder, um, which I often liken to the, to the weather, the internal weather. Now, we all are aware that the weather is a real thing. If you go outside and it's raining, you can't pretend it isn't raining. You can't make it unrain. On the other hand, it's also important to realize that it's not your fault that it's raining. 
Only a very primitive person would imagine that it's raining because they've done something bad. That's how mankind used to believe, but no longer do we think that. So it's not your fault, but it is real. And most importantly, it's not permanent. It's not going to rain every day. Just as it's raining now doesn't mean it's going to rain tomorrow and the next day and for the rest of your life. Oh, damn, it's raining. That's it. My life is going to be wet from now on. <laughs> but that's how one feels about the internal weather of a mood disorder. You either say, oh, it's not really raining. I'm not really feeling this. But you are. You can't deny it. It's true. It's real. You feel this bad, this black, this terrible. Don't pretend you don't. You can't unthink it. On the other hand, it isn't your fault. You haven't caused it by some moral failing, some, you know, some lapse in your deontic duty. It's not that either. And nor does it mean that you're going to be like this for the rest of your life. It will change. It will be sunny someday. You don't know when because it's not in your control. It's not your fault. And you can't necessarily change it. But you can adapt to it and prepare for it. So if you have that kind of mood disorder, what are the most obvious ways to change your mood in our culture? Especially if you don't know that what you've got is an illness. You just feel it. You just feel down or you feel up. Well, I'm afraid, you can call it a weakness, but it's a very, I think, forgivable one, perhaps, if you're kind. You reach out for drugs and alcohol because they can change your mood. They can make you feel up when you're down, or they can, make you, they can bring you down if you're too up. And it seems so easy. All this noise in my head, I can quieten it. Just another vodka, just another line, just another tablet, just another whatever. Um, and, of course, we all know intellectually, we all know the truth of it. The more you do that, the worse, the worse it becomes when you go off them. The, you know, the, the, the greater the blackness, the... You know, the, 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 the greater the mood changes, the more violent the swings um, when you stop using them. And if you don't stop using them, the more you descend, the more your friends start to reject you or to, you know, to lose pity. Um, and that's how people slide down, especially those who don't have accepting and loving families, as I said earlier. Those, they slide down, they lose their jobs, they start to lose their homes, they become street people, they become a nuisance, they become embarrassing and smelly and you just want to forget them and pile them away across the street if you see them, screaming, crying, making noises, being drunk, whatever. It's horrible. And that's the worst side of it. And that is something that mental health can bring about. You, you know, ask any doctor, any mental health doctor working at the sharp end in, in, in an inner city somewhere, and the, the, it, it's, a, it's a story that's told every night on the streets. And it's a terrible story. So on that side, I'm very keen to explain how serious mental health, the outcomes, you know, the consequences of unattended and untreated or in some way um, unexamined, unscrutinized mental health issues, how, how serious that can be. But, on the other hand, I want to make it absolutely plain that it is possible to lead an immensely fulfilled, fulfilling, creatively exciting, thrilling, rewarding, loving, enriched and enriching life with those uh, diagnoses. It's been done by extraordinary, heroic people in history, ones we've all heard of uh, and ones you may not have heard of. My particular hero in this field is a, someone called Kay Redfield Jameson. She's a, an American academic, a double academic in the most extraordinary way. She's, um, she's the professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University in, uh, in, in, in America, which is the best teaching hospital in America. But she's also a visiting professor of English literature at St. Andrews University. And she's written some of the best books on mental health you could ever read, An Unquiet Mind and Touched by Fire, which is a history of retrospective diagnoses of uh, artists, warriors, creators, uh, historical figures, politicians, um, poets, and so on, uh, in the past, like Robert Schumann, and you know, very obvious examples of people who, who were very clearly affected by this disorder and, and how it, it can be traced in their work and in their diaries and so on. And she has the highest possible dose of lithium you can have without your kidneys exploding and has had since she was young and is a very seriously ill person indeed. But I can't think of many people who have had a more creative and um, extraordinary effect on both the illness, because she's a, 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 one of the most respected scientific and academic voices 
who understands it. She writes for the Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in America on that subject of bipolar disorder, but also on, on literature. So, you know, the, and, and in between there are artists and writers, and, you know, we can all choose our hero, like Churchill or someone, you know, his famous black dog, and, and um, uh, there are musicians and uh, uh, painters and artists who, as I say, c can be an inspiration to show, and just not necessarily well-known people, but people you may know who are well-known to you, who show that it is not a death sentence. So on the one hand, you have to balance this incredible seriousness. Uh, it can lead to, to, to disaster. And you have to understand its Im immense potential um, you know, to, you know, to be lived with and sometimes even, I believe, to enhance life. I, I made a film about bipolar disorder and I spoke to people, some of whom were really, had had desperate illness and had tried suicide so many times. It was astonishing. They were alive. There was one, one uh, man I, I spoke to who had walked out in front of a lorry and his legs had been smashed, his body had been smashed. And he'd been in a, in, 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 a, in a hospital there, but he'd managed to escape and walk out and try and kill himself. And uh, I said to him, I said, the, how many times were your bones reset? And he said, oh, uh, about 42 times. It's different operations to straighten. They were hammered out and bits of bone shoved in here and there. I said, the pain must be been awful. He said, no, what your viewers must understand is the pain in my legs was nothing compared to the pain that made me walk out in front of that lorry. That's the pain that really, really I could not bear. The pain in my legs was nothing. That was pretty astonishing. But I asked all of these people, including him, I asked them, I said, there's, suppose there's a button here, you can press the button. I was talking about, this is about bipolar disorder or manic depression, as it used to be known. I said, you can press the button and you will no longer have bipolar disorder. Taken away from you will be all the depressive episodes, the, the episodes of horrible black um, self-hatred and despair um, and lack of energy and lack of motivation, lack of belief in the future, all the things that depression brings. It will be, you'll never have them again. But nor, nor will you have the highs, nor will you have the buzz of the grandiosity and the exuberance and the hope and the self-belief and the creativity and the kind of joyful madness that sometimes comes with mania. They'll, they'll both go. Would, would you press the button? And only one of the 42, I think, people I interviewed would press the button, which is a very extraordinary thing. So somehow, W.H. Auden said it um, very well. Don't take away my devils, because my angels will flee too. And, and I think it's a deep sense we all have as humans that, that the bad things we have uh, are a price that we don't want to pay, but we understand has to be paid for the really good things we have. And that is a bargain most of us are, are prepared to make. We're all aware of the ethics professor and there, you know, I press this button and Hitler is never born, but then neither is Mozart or whoever you're choice would be of someone who brought an equal measure of joy to the equal measure of despair that Hitler brought. And most people get and say, no, you can't, you can't do that. It's, we don't want to zombify history and we don't want to zombify the gene pool of our, of our species and we don't want to zombify our own lives. And that, that will bring me, and I, I know I'm coming to the end of it, I said I'd speak for 20 minutes, I'm already, oh, I'm so sorry. I do go on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we might come on to the subject of me uh, medication if uh, someone wants to ask that as a question, because what I'm going to do now, I feel I should, is sit down and let Jenna uh, ask me a few questions, which she, I know, wants to do. Um, and no, Jenna, I'm, I'm married, so no. Um, <laughs> but Damn. A few years ago, maybe, yeah. No, I mean, not a few years ago in your case, because you'd be too... No, oh, God. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what I mean. So, Thank you. they... Um, <laughs> oh, hell, what have I said? Um, so, and then he will ask you a few questions, and then maybe, maybe any one of you would, l would like to ask some questions, or indeed tweet some questions too. But for the, for the time being, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for the end bit. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely and unexpected. Uh, I suppose the first question I have, and just because it's come to mind, because you just said it, and I'll forget it otherwise. <coughs> um, you mentioned about the fact that you asked the question about pressing the button, mm. and if everybody could turn off their bipolar disorder and get rid of it from their lives, would they? Would you? Well, I, I would say that I would not press the button, but I, I know I haven't, I haven't dwelt on this, and I still find it difficult to do so, but... 
there have been a few occasions in the last 20 years, um, one in particular when I have very, very seriously attempted to take my own life to, you know, to the point of being discovered unconscious and, and having to be rescued from the brink of it. And the distress and worry that that caused my family and, and, and those who, who love me or tell me they do, um, uh, obviously it was so horrific. And, and the possibility that I might have succeeded uh, in ending my life, so, so terrible to me now that life you know, is something that I value so highly, um, that anything that would jeopardize living seems to me something that is intolerable. So it's very hard to say um, precisely, as all good ethical questions about pressing buttons are, you know. Um, and, but, but I, generally speaking, I understand why most people say no, and I would probably say no now, I'd say it now. But I would reserve the right to have a different view at another right. time. I think that's the point. And so do you think that those sort of mania periods, those periods where you say you feel the buzz, the exuberance, the, the colour of life, do you think those have sort of made you who you are as much as the downs and the blacks? It, 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 it would be impertinent to me to deny that. I suppose they must be part of who I am. I mean, there is this sort of get-out clause that people with bipolar disorder have, which is that it is known officially, whatever that means, as a mood disorder, not a personality disorder. You know, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's sort of rather like, it's, it's, it's the weather inside me. It's not who I am, it's what, it's what happens to my moods. Uh, you know, the, the ship that is trying to plough ahead, it's just the seas are the illness. Whether they're incredibly calm or incredibly violent is not the fault of the ship. But, you know, that's a, that's a weaselly get-out. I, um, I suppose it is a part of who I am, and I, you know, which of us would dare take out any element of ourselves and be sure that the whole Jenga tower of our identity wouldn't collapse? That's a ridiculous thing to have said. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean. It's a good image. <laughs> it's a good image. Um, you talked about your childhood and your adolescence yeah. and prison. Um, do you think, I suppose it's a, it's a slightly scientific answer to this, but... Mm -hmm. How much of sort of uh, disorders of this type and generally uh, depression, clinical depression, comes from your circumstances and how much comes sort of genetic? Well, of course, it is a, an enormously important question and one that has exercised people's minds about human identity and characteristic, yeah. uh, characteristics since the dawn of writing and probably obviously before that, you know, how much are we the sum? I always... <laughs> My little joke, my little philosophical joke is, you know, it used to be called the nature-nurture argument. And there is, is it about one's nature or is it about one's nurture? But maybe it's about one's willpower. So I always call it the nature-nurture-Nietzsche um, <laughs> debate. But uh, um, <laughs> it, I don't know. The, the, no, one of the things, I was talking about this earlier to someone, um, you know how... Lots of statistic, statistics uh, apparently reveal that the number of diagnoses uh, uh, showing mental health disorders amongst young people at universities, for example, uh, um, but, but all over, school children and, and, and younger adults and, and, and the whole population have just gone up and up. And some people are saying, well, this is, this is just overdiagnosis. We're now aware of this. And some of them, like general anxiety disorder, are such vague terms that they have no real medical meaning, no epidemiological way of, uh, uh, of understanding them. But there is one thing that is as real as, as can be, and I, um, I'm president of a, uh, of a charity called Mind, which is a... Oh, did my voice go? No, it didn't, just I in my own head. <laughs> you see? There you are. A little bit of madness for you there, just to show it's real. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm president of this charity called Mind, which is a mental health charity, obviously, a, a, a major one in, in England and Wales. Uh, and I'm also, and this is very grand, I'm a fellow of the Royal College, or an honorary fellow, I should say, of the Royal <laughs> College of Psychiatrists. And... Um, and one of the things I have discovered, that, and you will probably know, your generation will know, when I was young, this phrase did not exist. Or if it did, it only existed in very recherche textbooks. And I knew of no one who had performed this act, if one calls it that, or had thought of performing it. And it's two little words, self-harm. It didn't exist. Now, I go to schools and... I mention the subject and people come up to me and say, yeah, it's an epidemic here. Absolutely ep epidemic. Now, at first I, I thought I'd re read about this, this, people cutting themselves and hurting themselves. And, and I had thought, well, maybe these are people from very disadvantaged families with abusive parents or parents who are drug addicts or alcoholics or single parents who are 
abandon them or whatever, you know, so the sort of life chances are very grim and so there's a, a reason there. But, you know, I can go to Eton College or Beedales and there is the same issue of self-harm as there is in the comprehensive, in a, in, in a, in a poor area of, of, of a city. It seems to be, and that you cannot say is just a question of, oh, because you can diagnose it. These are real cuts. These are real physical, you know, the evidence is there. It's written into people's bodies that there is this terrible problem of pain because all the people I've spoken to who've hurt themselves say they do it because, because they hurt so much inside. They do this to, to take the pain away from, from inside themselves. And that's, that's something you can't, you can't just wish away and, and, and in a sort of Daily Mail leader just say it's all to do with, you know, stupid liberal people talking about, um, you know, talking about diagnosis or Americans going on about it. Because it's real and it's physical. So that's uh, interesting, isn't it? And whether that is, uh, I mean, that doesn't, and the reason I mentioned that is because you said, is it background or, you know, because there doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be a clue as to the kind of background you have that makes you hurt yourself. So I don't know, Jenna. Okay. That was, that was heavy. It was heavy, sorry. We'll get lighter. <laughs> no, but it's no, right. No, soon. Too important. Yeah. Um, one, one more sort of heavy, I suppose. Um, people often ask me when I'm talking about mental health uh, why it is then that you have very high figures of suicide, depression, general anxiety in Western countries, and yet in war-torn countries like Syria, Iran, mm. Iraq, you don't really get that diagnosis, that, at least that level of uh, mm. depression, suicide, anxiety, whatever. Does that mean it's not there? Does it mean it's undiagnosed? Or? It's, a, it's a really, in, it is of course an interesting point because we're, we're bound to think uh, that it seems to be a first world problem somehow <laughs> that the, you know, the, the, the yes, the war torn, maybe war is a, just a, an extravagant collective unconscious form of self-harm <laughs> uh, in, in a strange way. Maybe, maybe that's what war is, is, a, is just a huge a, a huge example of people is a kind of madness, and it's a collective madness. But more interesting, perhaps, than that is, is um, you know, developing countries or completely undeveloped countries. You know, the uh, animist cultures in, uh, in, in the rainforests of, uh, of South, South America or, or, or Indonesia or, or wherever, where there are people more or less untouched by uh, our so-called civilization. <laughs> Uh, do they have uh, these issues? Well, the fact is they do, interestingly, uh, and, uh, and anthropologists have shown that there is an, an, an enormous amount of it, and they just have, obviously, a different, different language for it. It's often expressed in animist forms as a kinds, of, kinds of demonic possession, uh, as it used to be in our culture. I mean, even, even while this university still stood, the belief in demonic possession was very strong amongst professors, professor, pro, pro, professorial staff of the colleges to which we, you all belong. So, you know, it's within the memory, the memory of this town, human beings believed that others could be possessed by spirits. Um, we now use a different language, to, but the behaviours seem to be the same, and you can read from the earliest sources of, of humans behaving in ways that exhibit symptoms that we would now use our language of diagnosis for, but which earlier... People use, you know, possession and other such language, and that still exists in the third world. In, and I've been, I've seen uh, um, initiation um, rites, and I've seen um, um, sort of doctoring rites. You know, what we would call witch doctoring in the old days, but sort of, you know, primitive medicine is hard to find the right uh, phrase for it without sounding patronising. But uh, in Madagascar, I saw um, them uh, curing in inverted commas, and maybe they did. I don't know. A child of of, of some deep unhappiness. My worry was that it was. Um, um, something physical that could be perhaps helped, like uh, epilepsy, but I, I don't think it was epilepsy in a child. And maybe just the fact that the whole village uh, t made an effort and s put this child in the centre uh, and chanted and stroked and, 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 and went through this ritual, maybe that had some help, um, because it's certainly an act of corporate love that you don't get much in this, in this culture. Certainly. Um, I suppose... Uh, Touching on medication, mm. it, I suppose now that's something that you take yes. for your bipolar. Yes, rather than what is known in the trade as self-medication, which is what okay. <laughs> doctors very kindly call p 
people who take too much alcohol or, 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 or non-prescription drugs. Yeah. Um, but I don't do that anymore. Well, I have the odd drink, but I don't, uh, don't do anything naughty anymore. <laughs> uh, but it took me a very long time to consent to uh, medication. I think, l like uh, any of you who may have had um, uh, issues or that, that uh, may have brought you to a doctor because of mental health, the idea of stepping across, piercing the membrane that separates you from those people who take, you know, medication. Um, because we think of a medicated almost as you know, congruent with zombified, and we worry about that. As I was saying earlier, we, we're very afraid of having this edge taking off us, especially if you're in a, what is loosely called a creative um, um, industry. Uh, you know, where you live by your wits and your language and your ideas and your thoughts, uh, your ability to string a sentence together or to come up with an idea for something. Um, the, the prospect of that being taken away, um, being blunted, mm -hmm. the edge being, being eroded by a pill of some kind is a very terrifying one. And it was partly the... Uh, and, I, and also the knowledge that it's always so unreliable. I mean, you think you put a pill in... If you put a pill in your mouth to get rid of a headache, it more or less seems to work. We're all the same. When we have a headache, unless we're allergic to aspirin or something, you can take it. It'll usually work, unless it's a migraine. But when it comes to something that has to do with your mood, your behavior, your affect, as a psychiatrist would call it, you know, the way you sort of give off to other people, then we're very, very different from each other in a way that isn't the same as taking a pill. And I would adduce, uh, uh, to prove this, uh, alcohol. We all know people. We can all sit down with friends and have the same number of drinks. And one of the friends will get drunk very quickly. One of them will get rather aggressive and unpleasant and mean and rude. One of them will start taking their clothes off. Or <laughs> One of them will start slobbering <laughs> over you. One of them will get very, very maudlin and affectionate and sentimental. <laughs> Another one will just fall fast asleep. Another one will just leave and go home <laughs> and not want to be at the party anymore. And they've all had the same chemical. Identical, a very simple chemical. Alcohol, essentially, you know, compared to other um, compounds and things and uh, uh, organic chemicals that we ingest all the time. It's a pretty simple one. And yet, the effect is so different. Well, imagine how much more varied then are the effects of these psychotropic and uh, antipsychotic um, and, and calming drugs and, um, and you know, these, 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 these various drugs, antidepressants and things. Uh, imagine how varied they are from person to person because they're more complex than alcohol by a long way. Um, so it takes, it's a bit of an effort to go uh, on medication because you've, you've got to sit with the doctor and the doctor will say, we'll try you on these and we'll try this dose of this one and this one. They usually go together well. There's not too much contraindication in all the other phrases they use. And we'll try that for four weeks. We'll try that for four weeks. Oh, by the way, um, they'll affect your libido and you'll put on weight. Oh, great. I think I'll go back to cocaine, thank you very much. <laughs> but no, shush, no, wrong, mustn't, bad, sh no. Because so you don't you don't say that fortunately, <laughs> but the little demon that says it inside you, you you silence and you consent to try this particular regime for for however, and then that hasn't quite worked or it's worked a bit, but you feel this and you report it, and so he tweaks or she tweaks this amount of that one, and then a complete change, and then another complete change, and the, so eventually by about the fourth go in my case, and I know people who are still still battling to find the right cocktail, um, but I've settled on a, on a mixture for those who are interested in the chemical names. Well, one is very simple. It's lithium, lithium salts, lithium carbonate, um, which is extraordinary. It's an element, as we all know. It goes into your, into your exploding Samsungs and, uh, 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 as their batteries and so on. And, 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 um, and the other one is a thing called olanzapine, which is to bring me down if I get too hyper. Um, and those two seem to work together for me. And, and so far, I've been all right, have I? <laughs> Maybe not. How long have you uh, been taking them for? Um, this particular, for about two years now. Uh, wow. Yeah, two and a half, three years. Yeah. But, but, but I've been on other things for you longer. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So, that's, that's my thing. I'm sure someone in the room will also be on lithium. You have to have your blood tested every now and again because of the effect on the kidneys. That's the only other mm. thing. Wow. I, uh, I have a couple of questions on a lighter topic. 
and then we'll go to the first Okay. One. Um, first one, you read out all of Harry Potter books. I read them out. I did, yes. To a, I didn't read them to myself. No, no, I read, no, them, read out. them out. I read them out loud. To a microphone. <laughs> to a microphone, yes. Uh, which must have taken a while. But <laughs> yes. My question is, which was your favourite? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you have to remember, um, or at least... Uh, not remember, but I, I have to tell you that <laughs> um, this was 20 years ago, almost exactly, um, that my agent said, oh, Stephen, if you, um, there's an inquiry about doing a, a children's book. Uh, for an audiobook. Now, I like doing audiobooks. Or, uh, as you can probably tell, I love the sound of my own voice. And, <laughs> and uh, um, so I'm quite happy to sit in a studio and tell stories, you know, to read, read them. And I'd done quite a bit of it. And, and I thought, oh, a children's story. And I said, uh, well, is it uh, go good? And my agent said, well, I'm, I'm told the publishers say they're really excited by it and they think it, they're, they're Bloomsbury and they think it's very good and they'd love you to read it and the author would like you to read it. And I thought, <laughs> Half a morning, uh, and the <laughs> dog ran after the ball, and it was good. The end. Um, and then I got this manuscript through, and it was um, it was an adult novel length. It was eighty thousand words or so. But I started reading it, and I thought it was fun. It was about this boy who turns out to be a wizard. He didn't know that, but he he, he I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So I went along to this voiceover studio, and, th and there was this nice lady called Jo Rowling who, who had written it, and she was pleased as punch that it was going to be... Uh, uh, it has, has this gone? It's working now, but in case it stops. It does keep going off, doesn't it? Sorry about that. Yeah. So I, I can take this as well, in case you can't hear me. She was very nice, and uh, I read the, read the book uh, out. I read it out, as you say, and um, enjoyed it very much. And uh, over lunch on the second or third day when it was finished, uh, she said, well... I've written a second one, actually. <laughs> and I said, good for you. <laughs> Excellent. I said, I hope that wins the Smarty Award for fiction, too, because her first one won the Smarties Award, which is really... Um, and <laughs> she, she had said um, from the beginning that uh, she was very pleased that they were being read, and she liked the fact that I was reading them. She was a big... Uh, she liked the programmes I did with Hugh Laurie, and so uh, she'd sort of quote the lines... Uh, at me, which was very pleasing. Um, but she wanted it to be unabridged because she argued that children, you know, read these uh, books to themselves while the audiobook is being read as well and they follow it with their fingers along the pages. And so if I say that instead of which or should instead of would or whatever, you know, they'll notice and it should be accurate. And, and that's, you know, that's part of the bargain. When you do an audiobook that's, uh, that's unabridged is you do it exactly as it's written. Anyway, in the, um, I think it was in the third one, which is called Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, um, there was a phrase, uh, very simple, three words. Uh, uh, for some reason, I couldn't get it out without adding about three extra syllables. And it was just, Harry pocketed did it. it. <laughs> See, I've done it again. I still can't say it. I genuinely cannot say, Harry pocketed did it. <laughs> Harry pocket, I can say, Harry pocketed it. But not, <laughs> Harry pocketed did it. it. <laughs> So, anyway, I was sitting there going, Harry Pocket did it all. <laughs> Lunchtime came. Jo wasn't actually in, in town at the time, so I called her up. I said, Jo, um, <laughs> that's a stupid thing, but I, I can't say Harry Pocket did it. Um, <laughs> would it be all right if I, if I just changed it, just, just this sentence, to Harry put it in his pocket, which I can say? <laughs> and she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that... Every subsequent book had the phrase Harry Pocket did it. It was marvellous to watch the growth of this from being a, a popular book that was liked by parents and um, became famous for being a book that parents read their children and then as their children fell asleep, the parents, you know, sat, stayed sitting at the edge of the bed or on top of the stairs reading it for themselves because they couldn't wait to get to the end of it. And, and by the fourth and fifth, it had become a, a remarkable phenomenon and towards the end, of course, the greatest publishing phenomenon of this or other, any age, really. <laughs> um, and, and I remember when she came back from, um, from the fourth one, I think it was, uh, she had her first uh, author tour of America, and Scholastic was the name of the publishers who published her over there, and it was as becoming as big in America, uh, if not bigger in some respects, than, than in Britain even. 
And uh, so she had this signing in New York, in, in a Barnes & Noble or uh, Doubleday, one of those large bookshops. And she was looking down from the stockroom, uh, as authors always do before, and saw the line of people just going round and round the block and up and up the avenue. I mean, just the most enormous. And people were coming up excitedly and saying, there are, there are 25 Harry Potters uh, in the queue. Uh, with, with little glasses and, and lightning flashes on their foreheads. Uh, and there, there are two women with gold frames around them, fat ladies in the portrait. Um, uh, and, you know, the, all these people dressed up. And, and she was very excited. And anyway, she started the signing. Hundreds of people. And you have a table, and there's someone from your agent, someone from the publishers, someone from the bookshop, just to make sure the books are put in front of you nicely and that people don't spend too long doing selfies, you know, because you can't see everybody if everyone comes behind for a selfie it won't work so you have to you know just sign it quickly and be as friendly as possible but about the 17th person in the queue handed an envelope to joe he said oh miss rowling i always get her name wrong um <laughs> miss rowling I, i'd love to give you this and and the person from the bookshop snatched it away he said thank you thank you and joe said oh, bless you i'm sorry uh do you, carried on signing and every now and again this would happen people would give her an envelope and someone from her agents or the bookshop or the publishers would snatch it away like that before she could even look at it she thought this was really odd by the time she got to the end she signed the last one and sort of shook her hand and shook out the cramp of it and sipped some wine and thought phew that was a heck of a an achievement she turned and said by the way all these nice people who had things to give me you snatched them away why did you do that I said oh joe these people will have written their own storylines for a Harry Potter novel in which Hermione marries Harry or you know, Snape murders Ron or something <laughs> like this. And, and you will accidentally put this in your next novel and they will try and sue you. Yeah? But we will be able to depose that in front of witnesses you never touch the envelope. It does not have your fingerprints on it. It's been placed in a safe, and we can depose that. So when they write and try and sue, we can say, fuck off out of my face, you mad bitch. <laughs> and Joe thought, I have entered a new... This doesn't happen to children's writers. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, of course, over the next few months and the next few years as she wrote new books, people said, I, I gave you that story idea in a, in a line that I signed, and, and they were able to say, fuck off, out of my face, you mad bitch. <laughs> and um, that was it. Anyway, that's that story. But it was wonderful, yeah. Do you have a favorite? Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. I am so busted. That's just me, isn't it? I, I'm so sorry. Um, yes, prob oh God, um, uh, probably the Goblet of Fire, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, there's one last question before I open to the floor. Um, our President Harry is a very big fan of your melt shit in Blackadder. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's. <laughs> You've answered the end of the question. That was, oh, good. That was what he was going to ask you to do. So Thank you, It's okay. Um, I'd now love to open questions up to the audience. Um, we've got about 15, 20 minutes. So Super. Whoever would like to start, I'll start with anyone on this side. Oop, there's a hand over there. Okay, we'll go Thank with this you. side. Uh, at the front, yes. <laughs> Just here. Yeah, you. Um, Hang on. You. So um, I wanted to ask... So Is you every, said, just before any... If anybody else starts their question with the word so, I will refuse to answer it. Okay. Just, just <laughs> saying, that's all right, carry on. Yeah. I'm glad so. I was the first then. <laughs> you said you had this. <laughs> you said so inside yourself. <laughs> carry on. <laughs> you said you had this uh, thirst for knowledge when you were younger and yeah. hope even now. Hmm. Uh, you wanted to know things all the time and you got a lot of enjoyment out of that. So I wonder how you feel about. Um, you know, the rise of social media nowadays, do you feel like that's actually kind of a curse in some ways? Because I think, you know, a lot of us get rewards out of checking our emails all the time. We want to know what that person's doing, what that person's saying. We want to have all this knowledge and influx, you know, coming into us. Do you feel like you get your life is overtaken by that in some ways now that it's all available and you mm. already had that? 
It's a very interesting question and, and one that I've puzzled over. I, I, uh, it so happens my life sort of coincided with the rise of, uh, of the digital age and then the networking age, if, as you might say. In um, my first year out of university, virtually, I, I bought, bought my first computer. And in 19, January 1984, I was the second person in Europe to buy an, an Apple Mac, the first being my friend Douglas Adams, who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We went into the shop together. He bought the first one, and I bought the second. Um, <laughs> and then 10 years after that, uh, um, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, and, and I'd been on the internet for some years before then. And so I sort of watched it all happen and with great excitement, and I was an early adopter of things like Twitter. And, and um, a part of me, is just terribly depressed by, but that's my own fault because I was so optimistic. I, I really believed when, when the networking of the internet began to be a real possibility, particularly with the invention of the World Wide Web, because email had been there all along. Um, but the, the speed of, of, of the connections and the inputs and outputs were, was so increased and, um, and software, and, and memory became so much cheaper and, and uh, I just thought the world was going to be connected and people would understand each other and talk to each other in ways that had never happened before and this was going to be a new dawn, a new, a new paradise of, of, of human society in which we would genuinely come to terms with all the things that distinguished us and made us different we would accept them and embrace them and we would go forward into sunlit uplands of glory and happiness and and I became aware that almost the opposite seems to have happened. We have withdrawn into tribalism and nativism and separate bubbles of uh, uh, misunderstanding and hatred and contempt for each other, refusal to accept um, other opinions, uh, uh, violent uh, antipathy, uh, uh, appalling rudeness and unkindness. The early days of what was called netiquette, uh, uh, in which you know politeness was part of. of, of of getting online as much as writing a modem script was part of getting online in the uh, 1980s. All that's gone, and yeah, it's very easy to get very upset about that. But on the other hand, there was also my optimism about knowledge and, and the way knowledge would spread. Things like Wikipedia, uh, when they first appeared, I was very excited by the possibility of that. It seemed to me to chime with the great Diderot um, uh, project, you know, the uh, encyclopédie, the, which was the great enlightenment idea in which all the great achievers and understanders of the world would pull together to, to create this great notional encyclopedia. And this was it. This was it. Um, and then what people began to worry and say to me, well, don't you see that it's shortening people's memories and it's their attention spans and their, you know, it's, because, it's, it's a race to the bottom in terms of triviality and stupidity and, and uh, intolerance. Um, and I, I look back at 1450, which was the year um, Gutenberg um, produced the first Bible using moving type. And at that time, there were reckoned to be 40 or 50,000 books in all of Europe. By the year 1500, 50 years later, there were reckoned to be 50 million. And that's how fast printing had moved th throughout uh, Northern Europe. Um, unbelievable speed uh, of transmission of knowledge. Um, uh, which is similar to, to what happened in the 1990s through, through to the present day. Um, and at the, the people who were the guardians of knowledge in, in the 15th century were, were the, the priests, and the, uh, the monks and the scriptorians who, who, who did the writing and the copying before printing existed. And they said, well, now that there are books, people will no longer need to know things. They will just pull them down and look at them up in a book. And there, there will be no knowledge anymore. And in fact, the reverse was true. This was the beginning of the birth of, of huge, huge transmission of knowledge around the globe and the rise of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution and everything else and, and, and political freedoms and so on of the 18th century being articulated and, and what seemed to be a good progress. And a, uh, um, but that had a dark side too and, and, and books, of course, were burned and people were imprisoned for writing them and tortured. Um, for doing so, um, and and yet you can't regret uh, you can't regret anything that came out of the writing, even wicked books. Mein, mein Kampf, you know, because Mein Kampf was written, you don't curse the printing press, and because there are Breitbart News exists or whatever you choose to be your enemy uh, online, you don't blame the internet. You don't blame you know it's human shaped. In the end, it, it, it's humans are going to solve the problem. 
um, because we've created it. And it, it, for every good thing that comes out of it, something monstrous seems to have uh, happened as well. But what I don't think, this is a very long answer again, I'm really sorry, because I'm trying to articulate what I think and I'm not quite sure what I think. One thing I have absolute faith in, and that's the human brain. Um, don't ever think that we are evolutionarily un incapable of coping with the amount of knowledge that is being yelled at us and streamed at us. Um, picture this. You can stand in a field in the countryside and it's a beautiful sunny day and there's no traffic, you're not near a road. And so even the turning over of a leaf a hundred yards away in the wind catches your eye. The, the silvery underside of it suddenly appears or a bird suddenly shifts in, in the undergrowth and you, you look towards it. Your senses are so keen, so able to detect the smallest movement out there in this landscape because that's how you imagine, that's how we've evolved to live because we're either looking for lunch or someone is looking at us as potential lunch and so our, our, our senses are very, very keen. But you can get on a train and two hours later you can be in the middle of Oxford Street and there are thousands of people all around you in different colours coming at you at enormous speeds, cars going past, voices in your ear, on the phone, people other talking, music coming out of shops. You're walking, you're on the phone as you're walking, and you can, you can process it all. You can cope with it all. There is no problem. The human brain is so extraordinary that it can detect the turning of a leaf, and then two hours later, it can... It can choose not to focus in on this extraordinary blaring noise of colours and, 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 and visions and sounds that are all around you. We are amazingly adept and we haven't even begun to test the boundaries of what we're capable of. So I, I wouldn't ever say that our minds are going to be softened or ruined or in some way destroyed. You know, it's perfectly possible to say that everything that's true of the internet will only make us richer because we now... We've got books, and we've got the countryside, and we've got physical exercise, and we've got the internet. And we can, they can all train us to make us better, in my view. Sorry, that was a long Thank answer. You. I'll try and be quicker. Lots of other people. Um, go. Right, should we go from this side, the back? Just right shut back. up, Stephen. If we can yeah. get a microphone over there. Thank you. Hello? Oh. Hi. Um, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, cheekily, I just want to preface the question by saying that you are the most amazingly eloquent man I've ever had the pleasure of oh, <laughs> Thank you. And, um, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to ask you, because you've played so many fantastic characters, and you've given us so much through them, which instantiation of your personality <laughs> was the funnest to play? Gosh. That's a really interesting thing. I, I mean, I've been very fortunate over, over the years to, to have been interesting, uh, played interesting characters. Um, I'm fully aware that the, my genetic, um, the genetic hand that I've been dealt is not such that I'm likely to be offered parts that, um, you know, has just, have just been turned down by, uh, by Tom Hiddleston or The Rock. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> So, so, you know, I have to accept what comes along with good grace. And uh, um, so a, a lead role in a movie is unlikely. So when, when the part of Oscar Wilde was, 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 you know, canvassed for me, that was something I leapt at because I'd always admired Oscar, as I said earlier. He'd been instrumental in sort of changing my view of language and, and, and looking at the world uh, and myself. Uh, so that was something. But... Um, I love playing grotesque characters. I mean, I love playing Lord Melchett in Blackadder that you very kindly, Harry, mentioned. Um, because, I suppose because uh, it's like those days when you were at school and you were doing imitations of school teachers, you know, that we love to, to, to mock our el elders and betters. And it's rather depressing now being the age of an actual Melchett, whereas I was in my 20s when I played him. So it was kind of fun, whereas now... Um, I, I have to be—I uh, have to be more grown up about things, I suppose. But I mean, you know, uh, acting is such an extraordinarily odd thing to do. It's—it's it's, um, you know, if you're a musician, you can you can keep your flute or your cello, or your piano. You can keep it separate from yourself. It's not you. 
It's there. It's your flute's in a flute case and your clarinet's in a clarinet case. And you pick it up and you blow down it and, and you, you, know, you practice with it as much as possible. When you're an actor, you are your own instrument. So this idea that you have to transform yourself is obviously kind of nonsense. What you really do, it's a bit like, you know, they said of Michelangelo um, that he had remarked when someone complimented him on the David, how, how did you find that? And he said, oh, it was in the marble. I just had to know which bits to take away. Because he, he did. It was the David was in the marble. Every sculpture is in a block of marble. You just take away the bits that aren't it. And that's what you do when you're acting. You take away, you know, you see there's a character. And you think, that's nothing like me. That's, I'm not like that. But actually, we're all of us, like every human that's ever existed. We just have to take away the bits that aren't that character. And what's left is that character. So it's always you. Um, and I think that's why most actors are a bit mad. Um, <laughs> is because they're playing with themselves all the time in, uh, in, in the... Uh, stop it. <laughs> really? Honestly. That reminds me, I came across this great quote by, by Kinsey. You, do you know, um, you know Alfred Kinsey it was a doctor in the 1950s who shocked America. It was a seismic moment when he produced the, what was known as the Kinsey Report. It was the Kinsey Report on the sexuality of the human male. And he had done a very simple thing is he'd gone and questioned as thousands and thousands of American men. A few years later he, he did The Sexuality of the Human Female. So there, those were his two books. But this was 50s, um, you know, cookies and, and milk America. Um, crew cuts and uh, decency and, uh, and so on. And they were shocked by the Kinsey Report because he held nothing back. He asked people about all their sexual experiences. And there was a journalist who said Dr. Kinsey said if we believe your report it says that 92% of American males masturbate more than five times a week. What does that say about American males? And Kinsey said, I guess it tells us that 8% are liars. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that's rather good. Yeah. Um, but thank you. I don't know what my favorite role is, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> God. I'm hopeless at answering questions, aren't I? So, but thank you anyway. <laughs> okay, we've got. So, oh, yep. sorry. Yep. Two more. Um, All right. Yes, uh, the front. Um, thank you. Uh, you were a student here 20 years before me. I was a student here 20 years before you guys, and I now have children who are undergraduates of your sort of age. And I'm very interested in the change in the pressures that, you know, that we are all under. And I wanted to question you and what you just said about we can you know we can take it we can mm. take the stimulation everywhere all the time uh, partly because i run a mental health website and you know if we know the statistics say that so many of the young people in this room and in this country are exhibiting you know more and more just to bring it back to mental health yeah. you know anxiety disorder and, and depression and the stress 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 do you do you really think it is right that our brain, this amazing human brain that we have, you know, in a world where it never stops, you guys, God knows how many windows you've got open and things you've got pinging, I know you have all the time. Um, and as a mother, I go, switch it off, you can't take it. We had peace and we had quiet, we could switch it off. And I genuinely do worry, maybe, that young, you know, people kind of can't switch off now and maybe, if the incidence of mental health problems really are rising so much, maybe we do have to question whether we can handle it. Or am I being, am I being an overprotective mother? No, well, no, maybe you are. I'm, um, it was, <laughs> I don't know, I can't say that you are. It was a very different time. I mean, when I was a student, there was a powerful, power-crazed, you might say, Tory woman in charge of the country. And there was, a, there was a maniac called Kim running North Korea. There was, it was, uh, there was a basically educationally subnormal president in, in the United States. It was a very different world. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, yes, you can so say objectively things look more difficult. And um, obviously I could blow smoke up all your bodies and say you're very brave to live in this world in which your prospects seem to be bleaker than young people's prospects were um, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we were all used, my generation was used to be more prosperous than the generation before us, and the generation after me was more prosperous than my, you know, and so on, and suddenly that seems to have stopped, and your chances of, 
I know. I don't want to. <laughs> don't want to make you feel very depressed, but I, I, you know, I'm not from a staggeringly rich family. But the first flat I had in London was in Chelsea um, for, after university. Just like, oh yeah, we yeah we better rent a flat. Uh, there's a nice one in Chelsea, and I don't think that's likely now for under ten thousand pounds a week. So that seems really bad, and you right to hate me for that. And I don't know how it was that I was so fortunate to be born when I was, and if I was fortunate, because I have to say, a lot of my friends didn't make it. A lot of my friends died through neglect, drug addiction, AIDS, the whole, I left Cambridge in 1981 at exactly the time the virus uh, manifested itself in, in, in the West, in America and in Europe. Uh, I lost a lot of people to that. I lost um, people to suicide. You know, a lot of people don't make it. They actually don't. Even in our molly-coddled West, you know, Cambridge graduates, for heaven's sake, we have people to make our beds in our rooms. We, what are we complaining about, really? It seems absurd. Yet, when I was there, actually, when I first arrived, Cambridge, as I'm sure it did to you, boasted, yeah, we got the highest suicide rate of any university in the world. You know, it's a complete lie. Every university says it, by the way. I have not been to a university where they don't say, apparently we've got the highest suicide, you know, as if it's a terrific boast. <laughs> but it's part of that belief you live in a particularly intense um, environment and a university should be intense and it should exercise your intellectual muscles and also your emotional muscles. You're finding out how to make friends, how to lose them, you're having rows with people, you're having feuds with people, you're getting excited about it and that is magnified under the extraordinarily searching lens of social media which is not only a lens that magnifies but like other lenses, it burns. You can be bullied and burnt by that lens in horrible ways that were unimaginable to our generation. That I, I absolutely admit. But I do think you can cope. I mean, there are certain things that a university must stand for and against. And I've always felt that beguiling and enticing as their works are, Cambridge is something that is a fortress that stands four square against Disney for example. Now, Disney have made some very nice films, you know, like Lion King, Charlie Good, Simba, ooh, yeah, nasty, <laughs> ooh, Scar, ooh, nasty. Um, and, but its motto is the biggest lie in our culture. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. No, they fucking don't. <laughs> they absolutely do not. And if you think they do, you are in for a life of crushing disappointment. <laughs> crushing. I mean, if you work your ass off, your dreams might come true. Well, not your dreams. I dreamt I had a row with Donald Trump in the supermarket. I don't want that <laughs> dream to come true. That would be a ridiculous dream. To, no, you know one's aspirations, your ambitions. How are the ambitions any of you have in this room, how are they going to come true? We've all lain in our beds at night, closing our eyes tight, wishing, oh, I'm fluent in Spanish and I open the batting for England or, or whatever, or I'm on a stage and I'm bigger than Prince. I, I'm, I'm a rock star. I'm a, you know, we've all done that. We all fantasize, but we all understand what fantasy is. It's, it's not real and it cannot come true by closing your eyes and wishing it. Wishers were ever fools, I think Cleopatra says. So when you wish upon a star, you are wasting your time. You really are. I mean, it's, you can admire stars and you can think about them, but look at what Newton did when he wished upon a star, as it were. He looked at a star and he thought about it. The fact is, the secret to life is so simple that no one wants to know it. <laughs> you can't write a book about it and make money out of it. And that is that you don't chase your dream, you don't wish upon a star, you, you work. You work. And if you are lucky, work is more fun than fun. You discover the joy of work. It's a terrible lesson to learn, but it's one that a university teaches because it's the only way you really get on. You study, which is a kind of work, and you think, which is the hardest kind of work there is. But there aren't any shortcuts. And, and that's, that's really important, that you stand up to a world that is selling shortcuts all the time, either in the form of the snake oil of self-help books, you know, 10 things they don't teach you at 
Harvard Business School and all that sort of rubbish, all those awful life coaching things. You, you stand up in front of that, or you stand up in front of religion that tells you it can shortcut you to bliss, or any other thing that has an answer that isn't the much more difficult, but at the same time much easier answer, is that you stand up for what this institution stands for, research, thought, insight, inspiration, yes, leaps of, of faith and thought intellectually and spiritually and in all kinds of directions. But you don't cheat. You know, you would, it's fun to be young and it's fun to be silly, but in the end, the absolute fundamental seriousness of a great education is that you don't cheat. You, you, you find out, you work, you discover, and you do it not by going to lectures, although they're often very good, but by <laughs> sitting up and talking to your friends about what you read and what you thought and what you argue about and so on. And, and it sounds very utopian to say that, but you're in a place where that utopian dream is realised for three years, four years, depending on what subjects you're taking or what, how long you're going to be here. And what an opportunity to stretch all those muscles. And... I would only say when talking about the internet, for example, and social media, although I, you know, I have whatever it is, a ridiculous number of 12 and a half million, whatever it is, um, Twitter followers, and all, all, that's very useful in some ways and charming, I know that if I was young, if I was your age, and certainly younger, if I was 15 and I was at school, I would look at friends standing in the playground, Snapchatting, and I would think, how lame, how pathetic. And I would, with my friends, I'd say, right, we are going off the grid. Right? <laughs> we are not going to have mobile phones. And so the teacher says, right, um, I want your essays emailed to me by six this evening. Um, so what's your address? And they go, well, it's teacher at school.com. No, 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 your physical address. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you my address. Well, how do I, where do I deliver the essay to? I've just told you, you email it. No, I don't have an email address. What? No, no, I'm not on the internet. Oh, your parents are very poor, are they? Well, we do have a scheme. No, no, I'm, they're on the internet. I'm not. I don't do it. Would it be ridiculous? Wouldn't it be fun? You would know, <laughs> just be fantastic. Your teacher would go spare. You've got to be on the internet. You, you don't have to. I don't have to be on the internet. It's not a law that says I have to be on it. You want an essay? I'll write you an essay, and I'll take it round to your house, and I'll put it through your letterbox, and you'll fucking read it on paper, <laughs> and you'll read my handwriting, or I'll type it on a typewriter. <laughs> And if you want me, you phone me, and at an agreed time, I might be there, but I don't have a mobile phone. So there. Wouldn't that be great? And, and you, you could write a magazine with your friends, and you'd use one of those old stencil duplicators, you know, with a hand thing like that. You'd make about 30 copies, and that's it. And you'd do it on very fuzzy on sort of blue-pink paper so it couldn't be photocopied. And so the number of copies you printed were the number of copies there were in the world, and there couldn't be any more. And you wouldn't let anybody clone it, because everything we have is cloned. Every picture, every sound, every moving image is cloned, and it's identical. There are no differences. Now, I love the digital world, and I love everything that it offers us, but not just in a sort of hipster, you know, hand-batch artisanal way do I like analog things, but I just think because there's so few of them now, and because I'm very contrary sort of person and I'm sure the best of you are, have, have got an imp inside you that is contrary to you'd say sod it I'm not interested in that I'm going to go off the grid and I think that would be very exciting so that anybody who's on for that email oh no um, <laughs> meet me by the old tree that was hit by lightning on the 3rd of October and we'll all meet there yeah okay <laughs> Right, I think uh, we are going to have to end there. But firstly, can I say thank you very much to Stephen for being here, for speaking, and for answering questions. And I'm so sorry that we didn't get to answer all of them. I wish we could, but we would be here till tomorrow. Um, which reminds me, tomorrow... <laughs> uh, <laughs> tomorrow we have uh, Michael Howard, the ex-leader of the Conservative Party... Um, who will be speaking in this chamber with the same lovely chairs, lovely water, uh, <laughs> and me. And that will be good fun. So if anyone wants to come along and grill him, that would be lovely. If he's going to be drinking the same water, I've got to piss in this bottle. LAUGHTER <laughs> 
I will, I'll watch out for that. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's, that's, uh, that's tomorrow, so if, you, if you're free, please do come down. Uh, we are also uh, collecting money for the mental health charity Mind, which Stephen mentioned. Uh, there will be buckets on the way out as we leave. And all that's left to say is, if you wouldn't mind remaining seated until we've left the chamber, just so we can make the flow easier. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for coming, and once again, round of applause.